Oh. Howdy. Howdy. Sorry. <laughs> um, we have an hour to get through a lot of information, and so we're going to get started. It's right at 11. Um, you're going to hear from three different people. Um, Jody Ford is going to kick off the meeting. He is from the college from the dean's office from the development council and misty corn is going to follow him about certification and then i will round out the meeting to talk about clinical teaching what to expect for next semester and answer any questions you have so thanks for your attention howdy, howdy. my name is jody ford i'm the senior director of development for the college of education and human development with the texas a&m foundation so i am uh, the money guy that uh, raises money for scholarships how many of you have scholarships Love to see that. Love to see every hand in this room raised uh, before too long. That's one of the dean's priorities. So what I'm here to talk about, and I have about five minutes, and I don't, I promise not to go over that, is uh, we started uh, a series of events starting this past fall. Uh, the first one being uh, up in Dallas in the uh, kind of the the. Richardson area, uh, Plano area, where we have donors uh, who are members of our develop development council. These are people that give twenty-five thousand dollars plus um, to help fund scholarships. And so this couple, the first couple, actually uh, hosted uh, a group of both principals and clinical teachers uh, in that area. We invite um, you know, anywhere from 30 to 40 students and anywhere from 20 to 30 principals, administrators, and teachers for the benefit of you in this room, for you to come and network with those people. Just in case things don't work out at your clinical teaching site, you have other opportunities to meet principals. So I want to encourage you, you're going to get an email in the next few weeks, actually probably mid-December once you've gotten, you've gotten your assignments uh, for where you're going to go clinical teach. Uh, and the subject line is going to be called student teacher event or clinical teacher event. I encourage you to open that. We're inviting you to various events, hopefully in early in the semester, before you get into 100% responsibility, so that you can come and interact and, and uh, network with sitting principals, sitting assistant principals, Teachers that are already in the field have been there anywhere from one year. We try to get kind of junior level teachers so that you can hear about kind of their, uh, you know, their experiences as they started entering the classroom. So I'd encourage you to click on that email, check your calendars, and come if at all possible. We had some great conversations. We had three principals, and we ended up with only three students there uh, because three of the other students had uh, conflicts. But it's a great opportunity, again, for you to, for you to, to network and hopefully create future mentors um, that you would, you would have availability to. So our first one is going to be in the, that, that same couple that hosted one. Uh, it was for Plano ISD, Frisco ISD, Richardson ISD, and Dallas ISD. Um, and so we invited clinical teachers from that area plus uh, some sitting principals. Um, and, uh, and so it's a great opportunity. It's a free meal. Free meal. We know uh, how college students all love to eat. So, uh, so come and, uh, and enjoy the fellowship, but more importantly, create those networks that will be invaluable for you in the future. Um, because I know that the three principals that were there, uh, all elementary principals, uh, a gentleman and two ladies, uh, but plus also some experienced uh, educators that were retired, but that imparted a, a wealth of information to the students that were there. Um, and we try to do it again early in the semester so that you're not in 100% responsibility and just can't get out of, uh, of things. Um, try to give you enough time to get there. So we're going to be doing uh, a couple in Dallas, maybe one in Fort Worth, possibly in San Antonio, and in Houston. Um, I know we're also working with the Northwest Harris County um, Aggie Moms Club to hopefully host one as, there as well. So if you're in the Tomball area or something like that, uh, be looking out for, uh, for an invitation. Um, and so with that, um, I'll turn it back over in uh, three minutes. So if you have questions, I'll give you a, a minute if you have any questions about something like that. But again, look for your emails, student teacher event, reply. One thing I will tell you about, let me, I'm gonna, just going to put something out there. RSVP means to reply whether or not you're coming. It's just a courtesy. It's something that will be invaluable in your future. RSVP doesn't mean just to reply if you're coming. And if you reply that you're coming, keep that commitment. We had some of those fall through the cracks at this last event, and we hear about it from our donors. They're like, we had six people that RSVP'd yes and didn't show up. That's a cost to those donors. So I will tell you, an Aggie doesn't lie, cheat, or steal. That's lying if you don't show up. 
It wasn't an emergency. So RSVP, reply, yes or no, regardless. That's my public service announcement. Thank you. <laughs> Howdy. Okay, I too am rushed for time. So we're going to kind of zip through most of the certification information. And you guys mostly know me, but I'm Misty Korn, and I will handle all of your certification as soon as graduation is complete. So um, we all know about my CEHD, the certification page. This was supposed to have been done by September 15th. Has everybody done this? Awesome. Okay. So you've requested approval. If you haven't already, you need to start thinking about a time to take your PPR exam. I recommend you get it done before you get in the classroom. It will save you a lot of headache. Okay, so the important stuff, the applying for certification. You will do this next semester. You can start around April 15th. If you have completed all of your certification exams, you can do it a little earlier. So again, you're back on the MyCHD page. Apply for certification. And that's going to take you here. The certification information form is a vital step. This is part of being cleared for certification. You will complete this form first. Then you're going to work your way down all of the steps. You want to move forward, Mary? The certification information form is what you're going to provide to me with your home address. So if you don't know where you're going, put your permanent address. Put mom and dad, grandpa, grandma, somebody's address on there. So if we need to reach you after graduation, we can. Also, the most important thing, I need an email that is not your A&M email. Whatever email you list on there, that is the email that I'm going to send your letter of intent. This is to be used with your job applications. It will tell your, the folks that you're applying to, the districts, that you are currently enrolled, you are in clinical teaching, you are working towards completing your requirements and your degree, and as soon as you graduate, we anticipate that we will be certifying you. They're going to want to see this. They're going to want to know you're in good standing. They're going to want to know what test you're taking. So make sure you get this done. The deadline for this is March 15th. Now, I know that's in spring break, but you can fill this form out today, tomorrow, anytime between now and then. When I get back from spring break, I'll start emailing those letters, and they're going to go to, again, the email that you put on the form. So if you don't get it and you know you filled the form out, go check your Gmail account or your Yahoo account because that's probably where it is. Okay, we can move on. Okay, April 15th, if you've passed all of your exams, you can start applying for certification. When you get to this website, you can see it's a hyperlink. It has instructions that will walk you through how to apply for certification. You'll list everything on one application. So the core subjects and the ESL goes on one. If you're math, science, or four through eight, that will go on there as, long, as well as your ESL if you take it. The only difference is if you're four through eight, you cannot list core subjects. Because remember, you can't get certified in that. You can just take the test. You, you'll add that on after you've been certified. You'll pay your $77 fee. You'll take an exit survey that, that's conducted by TEA. They want to know how well you were prepared and how you did during student teaching. Did we teach you everything you needed to know? And then you are, can you go back one, Mary? Then we're going to, we're going to, the next step is fingerprinting. We can talk about that later, but make sure you get every one of these steps done before graduation because look around. These are all the people I'm going to have to certify. And you're not the only group. There's five other groups. So if I get to your name on the list and you haven't done one of these things, I'm skipping you. And that could mean it is the middle of June before I get done and contact you. Okay, we can go. When you're applying, you're going to select university-based. 
It's Texas A&M, and then it says university-based in quotations. You'll pay your fee, and you'll do the exit survey, and then that is all you have to do. It'll hang out there until graduation. <coughs> Fingerprinting. If you have done fingerprinting because you've worked in an after-school care, a daycare, anything like that, you do not have to do it again. If you get ready to go and you're going to do clinical teaching and your district says we need you to do fingerprinting, you're going to do it then, but you can use the same process. Now, only exception, if they pay for it, let them pay for it. A lot of districts will pay for it. So if they pay for your fingerprinting, let them pay for it. They're still going into the TEA system. So when you get to this step in your application, you just skip it. It should all sync up together. When you pay the fee, it's going to send you an email. It's called a fast pass. That fast pass is your next step. With that, it tells you where to go make the reservation to have your fingerprints done and how to, in what time frame you need to do it. So you're going to pay $39 to TEA, and then when you show up to do your fingerprinting, you're going to have to pay another $10. These places are not in the best neighborhoods in the big cities, so take a friend. Yes? Like, what would you have been fingerprinted for? Working at a preschool. Then it should be in there. Um, if you think for some reason it's in there, just call TEA. They can look it up. You give them your social and they say, oh, yeah, you're here. Don't worry. Um, a lot of people ask about concealed license and different stuff like that. That's totally different. So even though you've done fingerprints for stuff like that, it's not going to be in the system. Okay. Next. Okay, please do not email me before graduation and ask me to certify you. I am going to simply reply back, no. It is against the law. Your degree has to be conferred before I can issue a certification. You're going to graduate on Friday. Degrees will be posted in Howdy for me to see usually on Tuesday. So on Tuesday is when I start the process. Again, there are several hundred of you. So please be patient with me because every time you email me asking me if I can do that, that's taking time away from me certifying other people and I'm likely going to just delete your email. If a district says, we want to hire you, it's May 1st, our school board meets tomorrow, call A&M and have them certify you so we can sign a contract. No. If they, they can call me and I can remind them because they do know that that's the law. That's where your letter of intent becomes important. That's where you say, I don't graduate until May 12th or whatever it is. After that, they will certify me. With that being said, if you get hired, if you have an offer, email me and I will put you at the front of my list. I will do all of those people who have been hired first or who have contracts waiting. Soon as that happens, as soon as I certify you, you're going to get an email from TEA that says you've been recommended for certification. Within two days, your certification is complete. You can forward that email to your district and sign your contract then. I'll be honest, May is a rough time. There are more students graduating. It takes me longer. So if you have a contract waiting and they want it signed quickly, let me know and I'll put you at the front of the list. Okay. So just because you graduate doesn't mean you're getting certified. Are we clear? Those are two totally different things. If once you graduate, you want to add your core subjects. So for you 4 through 8 people, I'm talking to you. If you've done 4 through 8 math, science, or English language arts, and you've also taken the core subjects exam, you're going to go to the TEA website, which is this link, and you're going to follow the steps there to add the core subjects onto your already existing certification. 
Unfortunately, you have to pay the $77 fee again. But the law says we can't certify you in that area because we didn't train you in that area and your clinical teaching experience wasn't in that area. Once you've been certified and you are teaching kindergarten and it's five years down the road and you decide that you want to teach high school math, all you have to do is go to the TEA website, sign up on your ETS website to take the high school math exam, pass it, add it to your certification, and then you can teach it. But you can't take any extra test until your certification is complete. For your PPR, that is required for every certification. It is not a content area. So regardless if you're getting certified in welding or EC6, you have to have the PPR. That's not something you have to list on your application. It's just assumed that if you're getting certified, you've also passed that. In order to pass that, there's a few study guides that I recommend. One is the PPR exam resources on the ETS website. It's an interactive test. It's free. It's a very good resource. Also, T-CERT. You guys should still have access to that. That's the Tarleton website. The PPR is on there. And then you can still use your code for Certified Teacher for a discount. Using this code on Certified Teacher will get you access to the PPR exam for $25. There's a checklist on the website. Um, it may be something you want to do before you start clinical teaching. Print it out, copy it, whatever, hold on to it and check things off as you go. Some of them you're going to already be able to check off, like past your content exam. But you can use this to kind of mark your progress throughout the last semester. Oh, this is EC6. So, again, a reminder, are we all clear on that? Please don't, don't hesitate if you have questions. Even though you took the test, you cannot add it to your certification if you are a 4 through 8. Okay. Um, there's my info. It's best to reach me by email. You're welcome to stop by. As you go through clinical teaching, I will send some reminders through the clinical teaching office to you to remind you of the steps. But everything is on the CEHD website, so you should be able to, to move forward as you need to. Any questions? Yes? So I know you said we can do the application before April 15th if we've done all our tests, right? Yeah, you can. So I've already passed the max, the 4th grade, and the PPR. Can I do it? Now or sure, if you've got $78 burning a hole in your pocket, yep. There you go. Yeah, you can do it. Any other questions? Yes. I've applied on the website for certification, but I um, did it before I passed my ESL. Will it show up? Okay, good question. So she said she applied before she passed her ESL, and she didn't add her ESL on there. When I go in to recommend you, the first thing I do is I, obviously I check your degree and then I'm going to go look at your grades and then I look at your test that you've passed. So if I look at it and I say, oh, wow, you know, she must have forgot to put ESL, I'm going to put on there every test that you've passed that I legally can. The only ones I'm not going to do is if you're a four through eight and you pass core subjects Legally, I can't do that. So no worries if you mess up on that application, if you list the PPR, if you misspell something, if you use different words, don't worry. I'm going in there and I'm checking and I'll put it in the correct way. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, good luck, y'all. Have a great clinical teaching semester and happy Thanksgiving. Where are the sign-in sheets? Okay. Okay. Just know that a sign-in sheet is coming around and you need to make sure that you have signed in before you leave here today. So if I get finished and it, it's coming, it started at the back. Yes. This is a different meeting from Senior Methods. So yes, we need record that you were at this 11 to 12 meeting. So make sure as it's coming around that you 
sign off, okay? Um, one other thing I'm going to mention, this PowerPoint and um, video will be available once this meeting's over and we hold the makeup meeting. So if there's something you need to write down or take a picture of to have in the next few days, then please do so. But know you'll have access to all this information. Um, and once it's available, we'll send you an email. So you guys have registration opened and you've already registered or it should be this week, next week, registering. Okay. So you know if you're staying what we would consider local, you're in Section 500. If you're leaving the local area, you're Section 550. Just a difference, a little bit difference in fees. And then depending on what area you're getting certified will depend on which course you sign up for. If you need the 12 hours, remember there is a T425 option. Any certification can sign up for that if you need that for financial aid. But the six-hour course is considered full-time. So there's a good chance that you will just need the six hours. So you just need to check with your financial aid officer if that's something that's going to be a problem. Everybody have that information? Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk... Um, some details about what to expect in clinical teaching and just some overall um, just important things to keep in mind as you start and go through next semester. Obviously, you get one chance to make a first impression, and so be very mindful when you take your initial step in introducing yourself to your mentor teacher and when you first meet your supervisor. Um, those impressions are very important, so just be really thoughtful. Um, Another big thing, remember, we are all guests when we go into school districts. They're going to have school and do what they do, whether we are there or not. And so at any given time, for whatever reason, they decide that you are not able to come back. Um, they have the right to do that. And we don't want that to happen. That means that you would have to sit out a semester and start this whole process over and come back in the fall. We don't want that. But just know that the whole time you're there, it's a 14-week job interview, but we are guests. And so um, just have that mindset when you're there. They are going to welcome you. They're going to want you to be part of their team. Um, it's going to be a great opportunity, but just always in the back of your mind realize that you're a guest in their school. Um, be thoughtful of that. No question, dress, punctuality, those are things that have been stressed. You've been in the field for two semesters now, so you know that expectation. Um, our goal is to have placements to you the first week in December. You will get an email with your placement information. Um, we do not even have, we probably have a fourth of the placements in the works um, that have been shared with us, so a lot of districts are still mapping that out. So once we have the majority of them by the first week in December, even if we don't, we're going to go ahead and send out what we do have. That will give you at least a couple of weeks to reach out to your assigned cooperating teacher and make plans to either meet them face-to-face, -face, visit over the phone. If you're moving home and you're going to go home when you finish your senior methods semester, there will be a week or two in there where you can go by the school. Maybe you can offer to bring them a Starbucks or bring them Chick-fil-A for lunch and just see the school, um, get a feel for the classroom where you're going to be, um, that will definitely make your first day a little less stressful because you will know what to expect. Is it required? No. So if it doesn't work out for you to do that, that's okay. Some of you may not have placements until the break. There are occasionally times where school districts just don't have all the pieces of the puzzle by the time you guys leave here, and so there may still be some pending placements. There's also potential that you will show up the first day and things have not all worked out like we thought they were going to. So just be mindful. Um, contact our office if you get there and, and it's not where you thought you were supposed to be or there's some miscommunication. doesn't happen often from fall to spring, but occasionally there, there may be a hiccup. So if your district requires you to do criminal history paperwork, if you've already gotten an email about that, if you haven't, you will get an email about that before the break. You must take care of that. If you show up the first day and you have not been cleared, they will not let you come on campus, and that will be an absence. I mean, you're going to have to make up that time if you're supposed to be there and you haven't done what you need to. So make sure that you take care of those requirements as you get emails moving forward. 
Um, I talked about first impressions. Remember last impressions. Um, your mentor teacher and your supervisor will be the two people that will be um, the strongest and most knowledgeable at recommending you for your first job. So um, just be really thoughtful in finishing strong and leaving a great lasting impression. Um, you might want to Google yourself and see what's out there. I'm guessing you guys have already had a conversation about this and talked about it, but your kids in clinical teaching will look you up. They want to know about you. They'll look you up on social media. Just make sure you are transitioning from being a college student to being a professional. And while you're not getting paid for clinical teaching, the school, the students see you as a professional. Um, you may want to think about what your voicemail says when somebody calls you and you don't answer. Um, Things like that, you're moving into a professional phase. So I would just be really um, thoughtful of how you um, present yourself if somebody's reaching out to you or looking you up on um, any kind of social media. The districts also, when they're hiring, do research to see what's out there as well. So just know that people are seeing what you are like outside of your role here as a student. The other thing I will say on social media, if you have a really bad day at your school, do not tweet about it. Do not say anything um, that can be taken. That goes back to that, you're a guest in the classroom. We have had students removed from their placement because of something they posted on social media. So just be very thoughtful. If you have a bad day, go home, go in the bathroom, shut the door, run the shower, and scream as loud as you need to. Say whatever you need to, call a friend that's in clinical teaching, vent with them, but do not put anything out there on social media that anyone could see and feel like you are saying something ugly about the school, a student, an administrator. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there. First day of clinical teaching, we talked about this back at our first meeting, it will be the very first day that students return to the school district after the fall when, after the winter break. Um, a lot of schools will start back on January 3rd, 4th, 5th, some will start back like on the 9th. So that will start your 65 days. You no longer follow A&M's calendar. So your spring break will be when the district has spring break. All the holidays will be. Um, if there's a good Friday, um, you, will, you will follow the district calendar. So there's Six, probably 50 districts that you guys will be in, so y'all's calendars will all be a little different. Um, so if you need to go, you can go ahead. Yes? Um, is it our job to figure out that last day of ours? So when we send placements to you, you will have your start date on there based on the, on the district calendar, and you will have your end date. That is assuming that you have no absences. So we will count your days and provide you with a start and end date. We'll also provide that to the district. Yes? Um, I just want to clarify. So we start when the students start, not on teacher in-service Correct. Okay. So TEA does not allow in-service days prior to your first official day in the class to count toward your 65 days. If there is a staff development day in February and you're in week six, then yes, those days count. But up before students start, those days, you should. I'm highly encouraging you to attend, but that does not count as your official start date. <laughs> Clear on that? Start date? Okay. So can. You can, absolutely. Visit with your mentor if there's something that you're going to benefit from. Some schools will have actually staff development and some things going on. Some will have work days where the teachers are getting back in their classroom, getting things situated. Great opportunity. Um, because you're fall to spring, you're not going to really see a true first day. So that's going to be the closest you're going to see to transitioning, getting ready for coming back from the break. So as much as you can be a part of, absolutely. Questions about first day. You will also meet with your supervisor by that first day. You may meet the day before, but for sure by that first day of clinical teaching, and that is a required seminar to be a part of, they're going to go over their detailed expectations of what they need from you when they need it, what the semester is going to look like. They're going to go over the handbook with you, very detailed. And so that is a required, any seminar your supervisor has is a requirement to be a part of. Okay. 
working during clinical teaching. Talked briefly about this. Hopefully, you will not have to get another job while you're clinical teaching, but if you do, just remember it cannot interfere. You cannot leave your requirements and expectations of clinical teaching to go to a job. So, All right, we are still revising the handbook. There's a few things that have changed that we need to tweak. And so once we get the current spring 2018 handbook online, we will email and you will have time over the holiday to read through the handbook and make sure you're clear on the expectations. When you meet with your supervisor for that very first seminar, the first day of clinical teaching, you will sign on page four that you have read the handbook and you understand all the expectations laid out. You will also sign that you've got insurance. You guys had to have insurance for senior methods. So that carries on for the school year. So just um, there's a couple of things that you are saying, acknowledging that you understand the expectations going to, to, into the semester. So over the break, you will want to spend a little time reading through the handbook. The handbook itself is just kind of an online guide for you, um, your supervisor. There are a few things in there for your mentor teacher. Um, serves as the syllabus for the course as far as what assignments you are expected to um, take care of. And like I said, that page four of the handbook, you will turn in a signed copy to your supervisor um, when you meet with them. The handbook also outlines just kind of the overall objectives. Like I talked about, this is transition from being a college student to being a professional. Um, it also is a great time to do some self-evaluation, self-reflection, where you start your clinical teaching, how things go throughout the semester and where you end up. Journaling is part of the expectation, and so that's a great tool to show um, just your progression and your maturity and your confidence moving from starting as a clinical teacher to be ready to be hired as a teacher. Um, also, it it's also talks about the relationship and stresses how, yes, we are serving a great benefit to the school. We are offering free labor <laughs> for 14 weeks in those schools. And so the, the mutual benefit that we provide the schools and that the school's providing a great environment for you to learn and grow under the guidance of a strong mentor so that you're best prepared for your own classroom. It also just kind of talks um, step by step what the semester is going to look like, how you're going to start with observing, you're going to move into team teaching, um, you're going to start with a few lessons, and then you're going to move into what we call full responsibility. So out of the 14 weeks you're there, four of those weeks you are in full responsibility. So the handbook will talk about what that means and you'll um, visit with your supervisor about what that's going to look like. It will look different. If you're in a testing grade and your mentor teacher um, is worried about some students, they may want to do whole group for certain subjects. You're still responsible for planning. Um, so what full responsibility looks like may be different, um, but you are, during those windows of time, responsible for planning and monitoring and adjusting as needed what the kids, what the students are learning and what that um, two-week window of education looks like. You will also have a three-way conference with your supervisor and your mentor teacher halfway through and then at the end. That's an opportunity for your mentor teacher to share some informal observations. Um, they see you on a day-to-day -day basis. So their perspective and what they see and some strengths they're going to see in you, they're going to be able to share. Um, the supervisor is going to come in and do those 45-minute formal observations. And so they're going to be looking for specific things during those times. And so it's a good opportunity for all of you to visit about how things are going. It's a good time for you to ask questions as well. As far as semester policy things that it talks about, 65 days is the very minimum required. So that's where we, when we count start to end, we count 65. So any absence, excused or unexcused, has to be made up. And I'll talk about absences in a minute. You are expected to attend all the seminars your supervisor holds for you. And, um, yeah, we talked about work. Okay, attendance. Because TEA requires a minimum of 65 days and you have an attendance log that you will sign each day, you will fill out, your mentor teacher will initial each day and you will submit to us at the end of the semester. Um, you are accountable for 
having record of being in the classroom for 65 days, bare minimum. So if you miss for any reason, if you're sick, you still have to make up the time. If you go do an interview, you still have to make up the time. And you actually have to be there the full day, all day. So you do not leave early to go to a seminar with your supervisor. Um, you don't leave early to go to take a test. Um, those things are not excused absences. So um, I will talk about what that actually means. But we have in the portal, just like for senior methods, where you record your absences, it will be the same way in clinical teaching. And then at the end of the semester, as you make up those days, you will go in and record your makeup time. So we have a trail of attendance and makeup time. So you'll have a hard copy for attendance and the electronic online. The great thing about the online form is when you submit that, it goes to the people that need to know. Your supervisor is informed, your mentor teacher is informed, our office is informed, and you get a copy. So it's important that you submit that attendance, that absence report, um, as soon as you know that you're going to be out. So like I said, TEA requires 65 days, and the reason that we're pressing this, some universities require you to go 15 weeks. So you're going well more than 65 days. So there's wiggle room in there for a day or two of absence um, of illness or something. But because we're only requiring the bare minimum of 65, then obviously to get 65, if you miss, you have to make it up. The policy as far as excused versus unexcused. Excused absences, just like for senior methods, anything that student rule seven says is excused, we would consider excused. So if you are absent because you are sick, you will enter that and you will make up one day for each absence. Okay? If it's an unexcused absence, if it's anything that is not a student rule seven excused absence, you make up two days for one day missed. Okay? So if your best friend is getting married and you need to miss a Friday, totally get that. Just know that you put that absence in at the end of the semester. You go two more days to make up for that day that you missed. Okay, is that clear? Any questions about that? Yes? Do we get like two of those? Like, did you say there was a limit on? Unexcused? Yeah. Yes. It's like senior methods. So with senior methods, if you miss one day, it's unexcused, you'd go from an A to a B, correct? Then if you miss two, it goes from a B to a C. After that, you don't get credit. So ours is the same. So we follow that same. So one unexcused, you would make up two days. Two unexcused, you would make up four days. Anything more than that, you would have to repeat the semester. So no more than two unexcused absences. If you're sick, then you may be sick for a week. We have kids that miss long periods of time because of illness. That's not the same. These are unexcused absences. Yes? So we allow one day for an excused interview. My hope would be that you could schedule that after school. The districts know that you're still in clinical teaching. So if you're having to miss that time, then yes, you absolutely have to make it up. But you get one day that we would consider excused for an interview. Any more than that, they become unexcused. Because it's not fair to your mentor teacher when you're still trying to finish your semester as a clinical teacher to be taking half days here and half days there. Um, you will have opportunities at career fair to do interviews, and you just may need to say, I've got you know another week left, and as soon as I finish my semester, here's my availability. Yes? No. Clinical teachings pass fail. Okay. It's S or U. So you either successfully complete the semester or you don't. So that's why we have the, the days make up um, versus a grade letter. TEA requires full days. Okay, I talked about that, but if you miss, if you decide that you need to go to the doctor because you feel bad and you're running a fever and the school nurse says you need to leave and you miss the last two hours, then that's half a day that you're going to need to make up on the end. Okay? If you decide that you're going to leave an hour early to go to the movie with a friend, that's unexcused, and so that would be a full day makeup at the end. So you cannot leave even for an hour without making up that time. 
because TEA is down to the minutes for how much time you are spending in the schools. So you need to be in your classroom from the time the teacher wants and needs you there to the end of the day. Yes. No, you can, you can only have two unexcused for the whole semester. Okay. Doesn't matter if they're back to back or not. So anything more than two unexcused absences, you're going to have to repeat the semester. It would be like in senior methods. If you miss three days, you would have a D in the courses and you would have to take the semester over. Okay? It's not fair to the school to have you here and then not there and here and not there. Obviously, we get sick. We have family issues that come up, those are all excused absences. Those are not going to count against you. You just have to make up the time. But unexcused during this window, I can equate it to as your first year as a teacher, you're not going to have the option to take a week off in October to go on a cruise. I mean, the school's just not going to give you a whole week of time to go do something you really want to do. So Yes, there's sick days built in, and we totally understand that. But this semester, you were in a professional role, and so you're expected to be there and, you know, finish the semester with the days that we require, TEA requires. Okay, yes? Um, I know you said something about the, uh, you're there until the teacher wants you there, and then when they expect you to leave. I know that it's like right now, sometimes my teacher, she tells me just to go ahead and go, but there's nothing that she needs for me to do. So is that still considered a full day even if the teacher stays? Or do I just need to tell her, no, I need to stay with her until she walks out the door? No. So the school day, so if your school starts at 7.30 and ends at 3, then that time is absolutely required to be recorded. If your teacher gets there at 7 and you're there at 7 and she says at 4 o'clock, you can go. I've got a few more things I'm going to grade and be here till 4.30, but you're good to go. You can go. But don't just assume because the bell rings at 3.30 and you've walked kids out to the car rider line that you're good to go. Because some teachers are going to be early morning. They're going to get there early, get everything done, and be ready to go as soon as they're able to. Others are going to be getting there later in the morning and staying later. So you are just on their schedule as far as um, when they need you there. Obviously, if it, you're not going to be expected to be there every night, day in and day out, till 8 or 9 o'clock. So if that becomes a pattern, then you'll want to visit with your supervisor. But being there a little early and staying late to be ready for the next day, yes. And I would record all of that time that you're there. Okay. Sure. Any other questions on attendance? So this will all be in the handbook. It'll be really clear, the expectations. And um, like I said, these logs will be uploaded at the end of the semester, and we have them on file when TEA comes to audit. They will do calculations to make sure that you have met that minimum time requirement. So that's why it's such a stick, sticky and specific amount of time that you have to be in the classroom. Yes? So this was a half day. You have to get one minute for like, the full semester. Yeah. Is most half days you're going to stay and do professional development. So the kids may leave early, but if you're there doing professional development for the afternoon, though, that time counts. Yeah, good question. Okay, anything else on attendance? Okay, moving on. The handbook also goes over just some general assignments that you are responsible for as the semester progresses. You will fill out a semester projected schedule. So you will sit down with your mentor teacher hopefully by the first week or so, and kind of map out when she sees or he sees the best time for you to be in full responsibility. So how you're going to work up to that, teach full responsibility, come back to teaching half days, maybe do some observations in other classes, and then build back up to full responsibility. It sounds like a long time, but the weeks will go by pretty quick, and so you need to have this mapped out. You don't want to be in week six and go, I haven't started full responsibility, so now I have seven weeks to get four weeks in. How's that going to work? So you definitely want to map that out with your mentor teacher, and you'll share that with your supervisor to make sure that the semester is, will there be changes to that? Absolutely. So just that that's fluid, but it needs to kind of be thought through and planned out. You will also turn in a weekly schedule to your supervisor. They need this because they're going to come do observations, and they don't want to show up when your mentor teacher is teaching or when you're on a field trip. So you will turn in weekly schedules to them so that they know when you're teaching, what you're teaching, and they can gauge and make sure that you're building up toward full responsibility as well. 
Will that change too? Probably. You'll have a fire drill one day in the middle of math, and so then you've pushed your math back to the next day. So it's fluid as well, and that will be something, depending on how your supervisor wants to be in communication, you'll text, you'll email, and say, this is my revised schedule based on circumstance that happens. So just know you will plan that each week, share that with your supervisor, and then let them know if things change. You will also keep a notebook at your desk. So hopefully you will have some very um, intentional space that's kind of yours. It may not be a true desk. It may be a table. It may be space in the back. But you'll keep a notebook so when your supervisor comes in to see how things are going or a principal or somebody walks in, they can flip open in your notebook, look at your lesson plans, look at your journal. Um, it's just kind of a, a good one-stop spot for them to come and see how things are going and um, that would be a good place if you have questions that you need to ask. You think of things to just kind of track that. You'll also keep your handbook in there, but that's just kind of important to keep a notebook available in your classroom for reference. We will all be on eCampus together. There will be a secondary, so middle grade secondary group and then an elementary group. There will be three different discussion posts throughout the semester. They are specific and um, intentional based on what's going on in your classroom. So it's not research you're having to go do. It's questions pertinent to what, what's going on, how do you feel prepared, what did you struggle with, how are things going now. And once you post, you then will read your peers' post and do some um, responses back to them. It's a great tool, especially if you're on a campus and you're the only Aggie clinical teacher there, to know that maybe some things that you struggle with or have questions about other students are in the same boat. They're just, you know, 100 miles away from you in a different school. So it is a great tool to stay connected throughout the semester. Um, but it's not, it's not a lot of work. It's just based on what you're seeing and what you're experiencing as your weeks go by. After each formal observation, you will do a reflection, just like you do for senior methods, for those walkthroughs that your professors do. Of course, this will be a very thorough 45-minute observation with some prompts specific for you to think through and answer and set some short-term goals for the next observation. You'll also do reflections after your midpoint conference and final conference. So you will have six reflections throughout your semester. At the end of the semester, you'll also do an evaluation on your mentor teacher and your supervisor. That's the only way we know how things are going. Obviously, if there's issues, you need to let us know during the semester. But if you have a great mentor teacher, rock star, you think, Everybody should have an opportunity to know this person and be in this person's room. We need to know that because we, you know, we have Aggies all over the state. And when we send information to different districts, if we know there's great teachers there, we want to be able to ask for them. So let us know if you have great teachers, great supervisors. If there's concerns that you have, let us know those as well. The handbook talks, there's a page in there about what the cooperating teacher is responsible for and what the supervisor is responsible for, and your supervisor will go over that with you during that seminar, that very first seminar. But your supervisor is your go-to person. They are your connection to A&M. So even if you're in McKinney ISD, your supervisor for McKinney ISD will be the first person that you go to to get some questions answered, and then if they don't know, they will get with us or you can contact us. There's also information in there about serving as substitutes. Um, every district has their own policy. What does A&M allow? So we allow, if the district allows you to serve as a sub, you would be required to go through their official sub training and be a cleared official sub for Louisville ISD. If they say that's okay, the only people you can sub for, the only person you can sub for during your 65-day window is your mentor teacher. They can't come and ask you to go down the hall and step into a second grade classroom that's not your group of students, okay? So the only people, the only person that you can sub for during your 65 days is your assigned mentor, okay? We allow up to three days of paid subbing, okay? We also allow, as far as A&M is concerned, a one thank you day, a day that you're not paid, the, sub, the mentor teacher does not have to take a day, but it's just a way to say thank you. So it's a day they can go 
to a workshop, they can go, they can sleep in, you know, they can take a day that's just a way for us to say thank you. Not all districts allow this. So that will be something your supervisor will communicate with you and you will clarify what their policy is as far as subbing. But we have had issues with students being asked because they couldn't find a sub for a teacher down the hall. They come down and say, can you go down and take over Ms. Smith's class? And your answer is going to be, unfortunately, A&M does not allow us to sub except for our own mentor teacher. Okay? So the option, if they look perplexed, would be to do what? Your mentor teacher could go down the hall. I'm not saying you say that, but that would be an answer, is you can stay in your classroom, and the mentor teacher could go down and cover that class. Um, but you cannot be asked. If you get put in that situation, you politely say, unfortunately, I cannot do that. If, it, if they ask you again, or if they make you feel like you should go do it, then you need to communicate that with your supervisor and let us know, okay? We don't want to put you in a bad situation. And I know, I mean, I know things happen. Crunch time comes and there's no sub in a classroom and there's 30 kids and what do we do? And they know you're great and they're like, she would be able to walk in there, he'd be able to step in there and do great. We don't think, we agree, but you're not responsible or liable during this 65 day window to just be a sub for the district. Okay, you're not getting from that what we, what this experience is meant for. Okay, so if that becomes a problem, first communicate with your supervisor and or let us know. Okay, because we can run interference. It happened this semester. I'm just telling you there's a chance it will happen. So you got to let us know. Okay, questions about that? The other thing in the handbook, it talks about if there are problems, if things aren't going well, if you get put on a growth plan, what does that mean? If things continue to not go well and you're not showing progression and you're terminated, what does that mean for the semester? Coming back, starting over. Like I said, you are guest. If for whatever reason they decide that they do not want you back in their school, they have that right. And it's a phone call to us and you're pulled from the school and you start the semester over. We don't want that to happen, but the reality is it can, it has. So just be mindful of being very professional um, and not doing anything that would cause them to feel like you didn't want to be there, you weren't happy there, this isn't what you asked for. You're not all going to get the perfect placement that you dreamed that you're going to get. You're not going to get the exact grade level, you're not going to end up at the school, excuse me, the school, the district, something's not going to be perfect, but you can learn, you can grow, you can have a great semester where you are. Don't let them feel like you don't want to be there. Okay? The back of the handbook has supplements. It has the forms that you're going to be turning into your supervisor. Um, it has a sample lesson plan. Some of your districts will have lesson plans already in place. And so if your supervisor expects you to write lesson plans and turn them in, you're going to use maybe the one that they have as a guide and as a model and make it personal. Um, you just need practice in scripting out lessons and being thoughtful in how your pacing goes and things like that. So there is a lesson plan expectation, but you may have a district model that, that's provided for you and that's okay. Um, the code of ethics and then the growth plan is in there as well. Okay, your career fair, as far as you being a clinical teacher and coming and bringing resumes and being professionally dressed and looking for jobs will be Monday, April 9th, the Expo Center. So I know most of you are coming on Monday to see career fair. So it will be a great opportunity if you come on Monday so that you have a feel for what to expect. It will be twice as large in the spring, just so you know because obviously lots more schools and districts are hiring in March than they are now. So your event will be large, well attended. There will be districts hiring, setting up interviews and offering contracts day of. So just be prepared for the potential for that on the Monday, April 9th. Yes. 
well, it's not an, ex you have to come to it, so it'll just be, it won't be one of your 65 days, but you won't, it'll just be a day. Yeah, it's not an unexcused absence. No, no, no. It's an excused absence. So, yes, you will still be in your classroom 65 days. Yes? If we wanted to go to another career fair out of state, would that count towards the unexcused absence, or would that be an excused absence? Are you coming to ours? Yes. If you come to ours and then you want to go to another one, then that would be one of those, you can have one interview, professional admission date. So... If it's just one other visit, then that would be excused. Yeah, you would make that one up, though. You would put it in the portal and make it up. Okay, questions about career fair? Yes? Are there all over the state there, or is it more Yes. So he asked who all is there. So even for this fall, I think we have eight or ten from out of state, and then most all the others are in state. There are public schools. There are charter schools. Um, very well attended. In the spring event, we have 107 entities in the fall. We'll have over 200 in the spring. So we will have people from all over the state. Obviously, it's a lot of regional, you know, a lot of Houston area, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, the local Region 6 area, San Antonio. Um, but like Wichita Falls is coming on Monday. And then San Antonio, um, Harlingen. So there are definitely, we're lots of representation around the state. Okay, any other questions on career fair? Okay. We talked about insurance. If for some reason you're not in senior methods this semester, know that you have to have liability insurance. You sign off on that page four to say that you have insurance. You don't want to have to use it, but it's free as a clinical teacher. You must have it because... If things happen, you want to be able to fall back to that. Okay? Okay. You will not be cleared for clinical teaching. We will not give you your placement and say that you are good to go until you, obviously, you guys have all been at the first meeting and now you're here. You have to have been advised. So you have to have mandatory advising each semester. Any criminal history paperwork that is required by the district or sent from our office for you to fill out, you must submit all of that paperwork and pass your primary content exam, which I'm assuming has happened. As far as the PPR, you guys have all been cleared to sign up and register for that. That is not an excused absence to miss clinical teaching. The PPR is one of those continually offered tests so there's no reason that you can't take it sometime between the end of senior methods and January 3rd. If you don't take it and you still have it out there, you've got spring break, you've got Saturdays, so you cannot miss a day of clinical teaching to go take your PPR. Okay? Did any of y'all go to grad last graduation, May graduation? Okay. So the college now is providing cords for all the students that graduate and are getting certified to teach in the state of Texas. So know when you get to graduation ceremony in May that you will be given a cord, and it symbolizes that you are being certified and you're going to be a teacher, hopefully, in the state of Texas, but you are certified to teach. And so that's kind of a neat, cool gesture. Um, so just know that that is going to be given to you, and that's the recognition that it serves. Yes? Um, do you know, or do you know who I can talk to? You? I have been told that clinical teaching does not count towards your hours to get your honors courts um, because it has failed. Is this correct or no? That would be a question to ask your advisor. She asked about hours, since it's a pass-fail course, whether it affects honors. It doesn't impact your GPA unless you are unsatisfactory, then it knocks it down, but it doesn't impact it going up. So that would be an advisor question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. What other questions? Okay, so you're going to look for an email from our office with your placement information. Okay. If it says pending when you get it, just sit tight. We are waiting for placement information from the district. 
we are at their mercy. If they're still trying to figure out where to put you, um, the best situation, or if they've had a change, also know that there is potential that you will get a placement and that that will get changed before you actually get there and start. Okay? You may get assigned to a teacher. That teacher decides over the break to not come back. Or they decide there's a better situation for you to be in. So when you get your placement, most of you, it will be correct, and it will be that way for the semester. But just realize that changes do happen. Okay? So be flexible. Be excited. Make great first impression. And remember, any of you guys that are going off, and leaving the Brian Cloud Station area, there is a very good chance that you will be on a campus. If not, you will be in a district with clinical teachers from other universities. Okay? Remember, you're representing A&M. We want the Aggie clinical teachers to be the best. We want you guys to be the ones that the principals are saying, we're fortunate that we have Aggies on our campus. So just be mindful that you're representing A&M. Um, you're setting... Um, just kind of a, the stage for future students to be able to come to that district. So students have done great jobs before you to allow you to go to those districts. So just be mindful um, of who you are and that you represent more than just you when you're out in the field. Okay? Any questions? All right. Have a great holiday.